Okay, today um, we're going to begin a conversation about what religion is. Um, we've seen a little bit of this uh, before. So in previous lectures, I've talked about Durkheim and his uh, framework of the elementary forms of religious life. And in uh, still other lectures, we've talked about Max Weber and what he views as the role of religion in capitalism, in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. But today, and in this series of lectures, I want us to do a little bit of a deeper dive into religion, into asking what religion is and how we might understand it. So religion is a belief system about what is sacred, um, and that that belief system as something sacred is held by a group of people. So this definition um, has two, well, really three important elements. One, beliefs. Two, sacred objects. And three, groups. Part of this means that religion is something that's collectively shared. That if I think something is sacred, but nobody else does, it's not really a religion. And um, the sociologists tend to study religion in a different way than what you might be used to when you think about religion. We don't really focus on the belief system part, or we don't focus either on individuals. Rather, we're interested in religion as a social institution. So we think about religion as a social institution. Now, Durkheim, as I've said in previous lectures, was enormously interested in religion. And his definition says that religion is, and I'll quote, a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. That is to think, say, things set apart and forbidden, which unite into one moral community called the church, all of those who adhere to them. I'll repeat that for, for, you, for you. Religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. This is perhaps the, the most famous part of the definition. So it's a system of beliefs and of practices relative to sacred things. To continue, Durkheim says, that is to say, things set apart and forbidden. So Durkheim defines sacred things as those things that are set apart or forbidden. Um, and I've given examples of this in my Durkheim lecture of how um, uh, things become sacred in part by becoming everyday objects that get transformed into sacred objects, into things that are set apart from the everyday. The other part of Durkheim's religion uh, definition is that he says that which unite into a single moral community called a church. So when Durkheim talks about a church, he's not talking about Christians. You shouldn't think of churches as Christianity for Durkheim. A synagogue is, in Durkheim's sense, a church, in part because he defines them as a single moral community. So religions are moral communities with a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. Again, is a, they're moral communities with a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. This definition that, of religion as a community is essential. And in this um, lecture, I'll make a distinction between religion and magic. Um, uh, uh, which is important both in anthropology and to the sociologists of religion. But Durkheim understands re religion as an eminently collective thing. This isn't just one thing in one person's heart or one person's belief. It involves congregations, groups of followers who worship together. Worshiping together usually means worshiping together, literally, in the same space. But it doesn't have to have that. It just is a collective moral community that share beliefs and practices about sacred things. And it transcends any one person's heart or one person's belief system. And typically, or essentially, I shouldn't say typically, is defined by a congregation of people who worship together. All religions in this definition make a distinction between the sacred and the poor of pain. Sacred things have special powers and that they deserve special attention or protection and are not everyday objects. So 
before you is the image of the Torah or the uh, Tanakh. Um, and this is a document within the Jewish tradition, which, for example, cannot be touched by your hands or should not be touched. And so the reason it's rolled like this is that you can unfold the text without physically touching the text. And as you read from it, you often you'll use an object, not a pen, but uh, an object that looks like a pen to follow along in the text. Actually, you go from right to left. Um, and uh, this um, uh, suggests that the object is not an everyday object. It's not to be interacted with in the way that other objects are to be interacted with. In Durkheim's words, they are protected and isolated by a series of prohibitions. So the prohibition on touching them is important. In Islam, the Quran is meant to be the book that is, holds the highest place in your house. And that's meant literally. You leave a Quran on the highest shelf. You don't put it down by the floor. And this is a kind of ritual that suggests the sacredness of the Quran. But these distinctions about the sacred are absolute distinctions, but also random. In other words, Durkheim notes that all kinds of things can be sacred in different religions and at different times. There's nothing inherent to the object that makes it sacred. Instead, it's the collective ritual and belief system that transforms it into sacred, sacred objects. The sacred then are, are special things, times, places, or words. The profane is simply the everyday or the mundane. An example of a sacred place would be a church, while a profane, profane place would be a home or workplace. And sometimes sacred places can look very similar to profane places. So here in the United States, mega churches don't look that different than a Home Depot. And I mean that quite literally, like they're really big box stores that could be a store, the Home Depot being a store where you sell like paints and tools and other kinds of home supplies, or it could be a church. But there's something about the space where mega churches are not a Home Depot. They're sacred places for the people who participate in them. So um, there's something that sets them apart. Part of what sets them apart, and the sacred things, is that they're protected and isolated by prohibitions. So for example, some churches require people to dress in a specific way and behave in a specific way within them. So if you travel to certain churches or if you travel to mosques, one of the things that you have to do is cover your head if you're a woman. Um, and as a man, there are certain things you can't wear in churches. Um, and this is part of what makes them sacred. The distinction then between what is sacred and what is profane is absolute but random. Anything can be made sacred. And this differs by the religion and by the place that the religion is observed within. So it's not just that um, sacred things uh, are universal across religions, but you know, Catholicism in Mexico is going to have different sacred objects than the Catholicism in the Philippines. So for example, some religions have beliefs about specific places, a mountain, and that mountain has no recognition for other religions. So for one religion, a place could be deeply sacred. And for people who aren't adherents to that religion, the sacredness of the place is not recognized. Some religions consider certain animals to be sacred. That is, animals that are pro, uh, protected, isolated, and prohibited, while other religions do not. So in the Muslim and Jewish religions, pork is a sacred object. It's a forbidden object. And for other religions, pork is perfectly acceptable. So this suggests how it's not inherent to the object, but it's inherent to the community and its rituals around the object that make it a sacred object. Now, why isn't religion magic? Um, to tease out what makes religion a social phenomenon, we can compare it to questions of magic and what magic is. Durkheim, in the elementary forms of religious life, spends a lot of time thinking about the difference between religion and magic. And he distinguishes between the two um, 
because even though both might have beliefs about the super supernatural, magic is not collective. This is the critical difference. The sacred nature is usually performed alone or by an individual. Another way of putting this is like, there is no church of magic, except today there is Wicca, um, but it's collective. And so Wicca is actually a religion, it's not magic. The critical distinction here is that where magic may believe in um, uh, uh, or even have an idea of supernatural forces, forces that are beyond the natural or the everyday, what makes any religion not magic is its collective nature. And part of that collective nature is how through a collective nature, um, there's meaning that is produced in people's lives. And I said earlier that megachurches um, uh, uh, look like stadiums or even big box stores, and this is an example of one of them here. This is a particularly fancy one um, uh, that you see in this image. But um, what the collectivity does in religion is create what Durkheim refers to as collective effervescence. And he defines collective effervescence as a sort of electricity generated from their closeness, an extraordinary height of exaltation. Um, and this experience of collective effervescence, of electricity that's generated, um, this experience of exaltation, is part of how people are connected to one another in a religion. So, um, Durkheim argues that religions generate or produce collective effervescence. This is something that Durkheim uses to make sense of very powerful religious experiences, the extraordinary height of exaltation. And the important part for Durkheim is that this feeling isn't just powerful individual experience, it unites the group because it makes them have a shared focus of attention. Importantly, I want to remind you that of previous points that I made in talking about religion, which is that um, for Durkheim, this kind of collective effervescence and this broader definition of religion has nothing to do with God. And so when we define a religion, we don't need to think about the define. Sacred things can exist without the divine. Sacred things, which are things that are set apart and that have a special meaning for a collective community. And people may have beliefs and practices set around those things. Some, building upon the Durkheimian tradition, have talked about civil religion, or religion that exists within a public or a group of people that has nothing to do with the divine or with God, but nonetheless creates a collective effervescence of experience. If any of you are passionate sports fans, you may have experienced this. Now, what I point to here is that sports fans often have sacred objects that are associated with their team. They also have rituals that they perform, that those sacred objects are set apart, and that they collectively engage in a process together where there is a sort of electricity generated by the closeness of the people who participate in it. And they often think of themselves as a moral community, a community of people who gather together, generate an enormous amount of shared meaning through their participation in these shared rituals. So if you are a major sports fan, think for a moment about what the different rituals are when you go to see a game. And are there particular things like songs that you sing at that game? Um, are there things that you do with other people that creates a kind of electricity and closeness? Are there even sacred objects, um, specific things that are very important to you as part of that? This understanding, then, can apply to a wide range of contexts. 
In this lecture, we're primarily going to be interested in more traditional religions, but I want you to have a broader conceptualization of what these ideas can do and what they can help you explain. Now, the distinction here is partially between theology versus the sociology of religion. Theology is the study of God and the study of the nature of and sociologists can't and really don't try to understand the nature of God or to understand which religious beliefs are right or wrong. And by this I mean in a scholastic sense. Sociologists who are religious themselves can, of course, in their individual lives, think about the nature of religion, think about questions of right or wrong. But as a group of scholars, they tend not to think about the study of God and the nature of God. Instead, they think about religion in different ways. They think about religious, religion's effects on people. For example, they try to understand why some people have particular religious beliefs and others don't. Why is it that some people are religious and others are secular? This is an example of religious, religion's effect on people or its non-effect on other people. They also think, ask why those beliefs are so important to some and meaningless to others. So why is it the case that religion is so important in some contexts and not at all important in others? Sociologists of religion try to understand also the consequences of religion, how it affects people's behavior and how it alters their lives. So here we see that sociologists try to answer questions like, how does religion affect people's behaviors? Why are some people religious and other people not? In the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, which we've talked about before, um, uh, uh, we see an example. Of this. So we see an example of Weber's approach where Weber is interested in how religion affects people's lives. What is the effect of religion on people's behaviors? To remind you, part of Weber's argument is to challenge the perspective of Karl Marx. Karl Marx suggested that religion was really a consequence of the economic form of production. Um, and he has a famous phrase to say, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. So religion is just a consequence of things. Um, uh, and, and Weber uh, of things economic. Weber argues against this. Weber says, actually, religion produces particular kinds of behaviors in people. So Weber's sociological study of religion noticed that Catholics and Protestants seemed to hold different social statuses. While many Protestants had high prestige and well-paying jobs, Catholics did not. And Weber was interested in why Catholics and Protestants had this distinction. And what he argued was that this was because of something about Protestantism that made it better suited to capitalism. He called this thing the Protestant ethic. Again, the core question is how religion affects people's behaviors. And Weber is interested then in how Protestantism as a, as a religion influences the behaviors of people. In particular, what Weber did was, was trace a strand of Protestantism, aesthetic Protestantism. These Protestants were a religious group who believed that only a certain number of people were predestined to be saved for eternity. That people could, and that none of us could know who was saved. Only God knew who was saved. Weber argued that these two beliefs, the idea of predestination and the inability to know who was a member of the elect created great anxiety in the people. And that one of the ways in which aesthetic Protestants tried to curb their anxiety was by searching for signs, that is, marks of the elect. They were looking for signs or for marks that they themselves had been chosen by God to be predestined for salvation. To enjoy wealth for these Protestants was considered a sin, but work for the sake of working hard was seen as holy and a sign of being saved. So if you spent your wealth on yourself, you were sinning. But if you worked hard for the sake of working hard, 
This was a sign of being saved. The unwillingness to work or laziness was a clear sign that you weren't saved by God. And so in early America, this meant that aesthetic Protestants worked hard, amassed wealth, and that instead of enjoying their wealth, they reinvested their wealth. And this is the origin of Protestantism. So what Faber is arguing is that a belief system of religion is tied to a series of practices that influence people's behaviors. So here we have a definition of religion that ties together Durkheim and Weber, and it helps us see how sociologists or scholars of religion understand religion, not as the study of God and the divine and the nature of God, but the study of community and how particular religious beliefs influence the actions or behaviors of people. 